thank you for coming. Um, it's great to see so many here, and I'm sure more will come after all the six o'clock lectures. This is the first Imperial College Robotics Society Megabyte event, and we've chosen it to be a discussion panel. We want you guys to get involved in this. The Robotics Society was founded around two and a half years ago, and it's basically, it's, it's a very simple concept. We're a bunch of students, we now have 70 paid members, and we just love making robots. The committee, Basic, the committee gets together at the summer and throughout the terms and tries to get, get money from departments, from external companies, and then you guys can come and propose projects and we can make some awesome robots. If you check on our website, I've just got it up briefly, we have quadricopters, 3D printers, we've got a UAV project this year, and, and many more on our wiki. So, and there will be sign-up forms at the end and upstairs when we're drinking, uh, when we're eating and drinking. So if you want to join up, if you want to see more of this kind of thing in the future, um, join that mailing list and we'll send you an email. So today, our talk, the name is a little bit ambiguous because halfway through the advertising we decided to change it a little bit just to make it, make the poster look better really and be more eye-catching because it was a long sentence and it was, how careful should we be making robot, robotics and robots a larger part of our lives? And now on the posters we have, should we fear AI? <laughs> I want today's dis discussion to be about, okay, AI and robotics, automation, and all these technologies that, you know, our, our guests are interested in. We want to know whether, you know, we should be thinking a little bit more in the future about whether, you know, the social and economic impact is going to be like some science fiction novels and movies uh, say it will be. So we hope to get you know, a more realistic view on that. The <coughs> schedule for the talk, 20 minutes for introduction. Each guest will have five minutes to say a little bit, uh, just hopefully sending out some ideas to provoke discussion. Um, after that, we'll have 40 minutes of discussion amongst the panelists in which I will pose some, some questions that I've had. And then at the end, we'll have 30 minutes in which we open it up to the, the audience and you guys can ask your questions to our guests. Okay, just before I introduce our guests, just for a little bit of fun, I uh, thought I would show you this video. Okay, so a quick introduction to our guests. Uh, we have handed out sheets, so uh, if you want to know more, ask, ask your neighbour, because they'll have a sheet. Okay, so first we have from Carnegie Mellon University, Professor Ila Nobach. Round of applause. <laughs> Ila Nobach is the Professor of Robotics and the Director of the Community Robotics Education Technology Empowerment Lab, or the CREATE Lab. And he is the head of the Remo Robotics Master Program in the Robotics Institute of Carnegie Mellon. Uh, the Create, Create Lab has many robotics projects from finding easy ways to convert gas cars into electric cars and, and, and so on, and also teaching regular non-expert citizens how to build robots. The second guest, we have Owen Holland. <laughs> professor Owen Holland is currently the professor of Cognitive Robotics at the Sackler Centre for Consciousness, Science and the Univers at the University of Sussex. Owen Holland is best known for his work in biologically inspired robotics. He has contributed to the theory and practice of collective robotics and algorithms, machine consciousness and other sub subfields. Next we have Kevin Warwick on the left. I'm on the right. On their left. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> professor Kevin Warwick is the professor of cybernetics at the University of Reading. He's best known for his studies on direct interfaces between computer systems and the human nervous system. He did a PhD and ha held a research post at Imperial College in this hey. department. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And Kevin's most recent research involves the invention of an intelligent deep brain stimulator to counteract the effects of Parkinson's disease tremors. 
And last but not least, we have Alan Winfield on your right. So, Professor Alan Winfield uh, works at the University of West of England as a Hewlett Packard Professor of Electronic Engineering. He co-founded Bristol Robotics Lab, where they work on swarm robotics, amongst other things, and he co-founded it with Owen Holland. Um, and he is committed to the dissemination of research and of research and ideas in science, engineering, and technology. And he was the leader of a three-year EPSRC program called Walking with Robots, which was a UK-wide program bringing intelligent robotics research into the public. So, once again, a round of applause for our... Okay, so can I ask you from the audience left to the audience right to uh, say something? You've got five minutes to say okay. something. Thank you. Oh, I've got a bit of a thingy just to put in. Is this down oh, to okay. my time? There we go. Have uh, go straight. Okay. There we go. Fantastic. Yep. Yeah, good. Um, all I wanted to do was just to give a broad spectrum when you're looking at robots, what do you mean, and just to see all the different possibilities. So when we're deciding on what possible with AI and so on. So present day, more robots, because I hadn't noticed the uh, title change until about uh, five minutes ago. Um, present day, one thing to take into account, battlefield unmanned aerial, aerial vehicles or combat aerial vehicles. There's also endurance UAVs that are going up for enormous amounts of time. You, these are things that are actually practically in use now. So if we're looking to control AI, curtail it, or look at potential things that could go wrong, these are perhaps the military areas are in the firing line directly. Um, for example, these are in use now. Um, the U.S. Air Force, sorry, the U.S., but there we go. Um, with 30 hours endurance, probably plus, uh, they carry typically a minimum of six 225 kilograms guided bombs, which they themselves are deciding on firing when and where and who, etc., etc. The right hand side, you can see the McDonnell Douglas X 36 pilotless fighter plane. These have no human pilots on board, just to be clear. Um, the, the philosophy, the, the UCAP missions are conducted by an operator, presumably a human, over a high-speed data link. The operator does not fly the UCAP, so the UCAP is sorting itself out, um, but acts in a supervisory role. Um, the UCAP actually can complete its mission without the human, and the vast majority of the time, so it does so. Um, the other thing, example along this time, peacekeeper missiles do have a human veto. They fire automatically, peacekeeper missiles, with no human interaction. They have a human veto, which it gives the human about 10 seconds to override. All the peacekeeper missiles that have ever been fired, which they're hundreds, if not a thousand, the veto has never once been used. So this human can press the button and stop it. Um, other examples, the UCAV Reaper been used in, by the US and British in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, it just, example, 2008, 174th Fighter Wing US moved from piloted planes to UAVs completely. So that's, and that, I think there have been other fighter wings now. The direction is clearly in the military that way. Even taking into account um, robot manipulators on production lines, non-intelligent robots, we need to throw them into the pot, uh, I think, in terms of control. Medical robots clearly are coming into place. I know there's some excellent work here in, in that. Imperial College probably leads the way in the UK for medical robotics. Um, there's also, as was mentioned, the area of implants. So this is people with <coughs> Parkinson's disease, with electronics in their brain. Are they just human? What if it goes wrong? What if the deep brain stimulator picks up a, a radio signal from um, Barack Obama and goes around killing people? What's the, who's to blame? <laughs> when you think of robots, robots now have biological brains as well. So it's quite possible to take a few neurons from Owen Holland, 
put them in a little dish, grow them, and then move, let them move around in a little robot body. Maybe you'd like that, or part of you would like it anyway. So when you think of robots can have biological brains, and hence, as far as philosophers are concerned, they can be conscious, think for themselves, etc., etc. Of course, we have to throw in cyborgs with part human, part machine brains. Are they, are we, robots? Can we limit the development? When we're talking of AI there, um, what are we talking about? This is a part human, part machine intelligence. Robots around the home, which was the uh, original topic, we're going to see many more in the future because there's all of us here. We're old guys. We're going to need robots to help us. Can we actually stop them harming humans? Can we program a robot not to harm a human, not to kill a human, as Asimov said, no robot that I'm aware of has ever, ever, ever been so programmed. And if you thought, I want to program a robot so it does not harm a human, wow, the sophistication you would need, even for the robot to decide that it is a human that it's interacting with, would be a tremendous thing in itself. No mind to decide when to kill it and when not. If it's just visual, we have robots that look like humans and so on. We've also got, the, if we're AI, the finance sector. The se sector. City of London now is not so much about advising purchases, it's all about the development of AI. You buy AI systems. Over 25% of transactions down the road in the City of London are AI decisions. There, there's no human in the loop. Um, and AI decisions can cause fatalities for a simple thing. A machine decides to buy coffee from Brazil and not from Kenya. As a result, thousands of people die in Kenya. How do you cater for that? So you get the machine not to, not to buy, not to... Well, that's what it's all about, is doing that. So there is a secondary level. A machine can decide to do something. As a result, people are injured, people die. So it's not the initial intent for the machine. Should we fear AI? Yes, of course we should. We've got to be very careful what we're doing. Um, a few years ago, published a book called March of the Machines. It's a must read for those of you that uh, um, want to look further into the fear that we should have and respect the, the, the worries the Terminator could be a reality. Thank you very much. And next we have Owen Holland, who's going to give a five minute presentation. Right, thank you. Well, I can't talk about AI because I managed to go from psychology to robotics without passing through AI, a course which I thoroughly recommend. It'll save years of your life. Um, and I was working with the title, How Careful Should We Be Making Robots Become Bigger Parts of Our Lives? Okay, what's a robot? Well, the decision, which uh, the uh, definition which I think is really the one that we've got to absorb was uh, created by Jordan Pollack of Brandeis University, and I'll read it out to you. My definition of a robot is a physical machine which interacts with the real world, is controlled by an algorithmic process, i.e. a program or circuit, can operate 24-7, and earn its own return on investment, often by putting humans out of work. The short thing is a robot is anything <laughs> like that that can put a human out of work. So I want to provoke, and I want to be negative rather than affirmative. Um, I think this is always the elephant in the room with robots. Uh, we've got to be aware of what's happening. So just do a quick survey. How many people here have got an iPhone or an iPad? Shoot those hands up. Wow. <laughs> All the, are you paying 9,000 fees and you can still afford them? This is uh, amazing. OK. Um, they're made by a company called uh, Foxconn, a Taiwanese uh, company based in China. And in August, the Financial Times announced that uh, Foxconn, the world's largest contract electronics manu manufacturer by revenue, plans to have as many robots as workers in its China factories within three years, according to its chief executive. Um, according to people who attended the function at which this was announced, the chief executive said the group would have up to 300,000 robots next year and 1 million by 2013. And the BBC, um, from similar source, um, actually got hold of the statement that was issued by the company afterwards. Mr. Gu added that the move towards automation was aimed at shifting workers from more routine tasks 
to more value-added positions in manufacturing, such as research and development, innovation, and other areas that are equally important to the success of our operations. Some analysts say that the automation could be another way to cut costs. So I'm not saying that there will be a million redundancies in this factory, but that would be one way of reading the information before Mr. Gu's um, announcement afterwards. So, um, these robots aren't about to become a bigger part of your lives, but their existence will certainly play a big part in the lives of an unknown number of Chinese factory employees. Um, it may actually um, <coughs> enable them to pursue careers in research and development, or free them up to pursue careers in research and development, or it may just free them up. We don't know. But... Um, this is one of the real threats, and uh, the book in which the word robot was coined actually conjures up this threat. Basically, robots were invented in Rossum's Universal Robots by Carol Chapek in order to carry out industrial tasks because they were cheaper. Um, so all the humans become redundant, and eventually the robots wipe them out. Um, so do think about this. Okay, um, and one other thing... Uh, China, to most of us, to some of you it's home, but for most of us it's a long way away. Um, is there a difference between taking our jobs and taking other people's jobs? Well, we hope, we hope not, because we're all liberals here. Um, some figures from Europe. Youth unemployment for the second quarter this year. Spain, 45%. Ireland, 29.8%. Greece, 42.9%. Poland, 24.9%. Do we need machines to take more jobs away from people? Anyway, that's just uh, the beginning. But that's not what we're really talking about. In order for robots to become bigger parts of our lives, what we mean is personal contacts between humans and robots. And there's kind of two sorts of contacts um, that we might think about. One is the bodily contact, and the applications that we're thinking here were mentioned by Kevin um, looking after old people who become disabled or looking after disabled people, it's very difficult often to find care. And in countries like Japan, with its prejudice against immigration, and uh, China, with the results of the one-child policy, there simply aren't going to be enough people to go round to look after the increasing numbers of old people. So if the alternative is nothing, then yes, we can say this is a good, the development of robots, to take the place of a human carer for dealing with bodily functions. Um, but the other side of the coin is psychological contact. And this is what particularly interests me as a former psychologist. Um, treating machines as if they are more than machines. Right, OK, we'll, we'll press on. Um, we are programmed to do that. <laughs> right. So what you can, um, what you've got to take into account is that humans are hardwired to perceive almost anything as being more than it is. Uh, an old psychology experiment just showed some shapes moving around on a screen, triangle, square, circle, moving around, and asked people, what's going on? Did they say there's some shapes moving around on the screen? No. They said the red circle is the yellow square's friend, but the green triangle is very aggressive. He's trying to get the yellow square, and so on. People would project, they would attribute characteristics to things that they did not possess. Now, how many people talk to animals? Don't be afraid. I talk to animals. How many people believe they understand what you say? I don't either, but it doesn't stop me, okay? But that's just an example. We attribute things to uh, animals. It's even worse with robots. You get people coming around a robot lab, they see your robot. Oh, is it a boy or a girl? Uh, we're absolutely hardwired to do this. And one of the things that really worried me is that it's going to be incredibly easy to let these things become a bigger part of our lives. And it's going to be completely fake and false. And what I'll leave you with is this thought. I suspect it's a zero-sum game. The more we increase the attention we give to robots as social, intelligent beings, the more we decrease the importance we'll give to humans. Thanks. Next we'll have Ilan Nobash. Well, this is fun. I like it. Um, I didn't think I was going to agree so violently with uh, my guest speakers. Well, let's see. The question is, should we fear this? Or are we, is it time to be worried? And I, uh, 
strongly believe the answer is yes, we should be worried. And that's not the bad news. The bad news is we're worrying about it all wrong. Um, there's a fundamental problem uh, we have internationally with our cultures, which is that the discourse we have about robotics and about the future and what we should worry about has been hijacked. It's been hijacked by media and by a Hollywood on top of the media that imagines a world in which we have superhumans battling uh, super robots, superhumans that have robot parts in them and super robots that are fighting the superhumans for control of the world. And we evolutionary developed life forms, of course, are at the bottom of the heap in that world. The problem is that the gap, as we talk about this distant image in the future, between the reality people seem to imagine about where robots are today, what they can actually do, and what robots actually are capable of in their rather shallow ineptitude in the research laboratory is widening. And it's widening more and more as people talk about this extreme future. And this, in turn, is making us, very oddly, farsighted. We're thinking about the future 100 years away, and we've stopped caring about the near future. And as a result, we're sleepwalking into a world in which robots are going to have direct impact on society and on culture, and we're not tracking it. There's three specific issues that we're sleepwalking into that I'm really concerned about and I want to bring up. So these mediocre robots we're going to have next year and the year after, they're not terribly good. You know, they're, they're much, much subhuman as compared to you and me and our friends. But they're going to be out there and they're going to interact with us and they're going to take our jobs. And there's three specific things I want to talk about. Economy, accountability, and identity. So I'll spend a minute on each of these and stop. So economy, there's two ways in which there's significant impact on the economy, and Owen's already uh, alluded to this. As you know, we have global recessionary pressure right now, and that recessionary pressure has a significant amount of cost cutting going on at companies all over the world. At the same time, robotic technology is taking off, and the result of that is that the companies are using robotic technologies to increase the productivity that they have, productivity per dollar and productivity per employer. World populations are going up. It doesn't take a math genius to see that as the companies discover more productivity, one day when recessionary pressures end, they're not going to hire more people because that would reduce their profit margins. We're headed into a world in which the level of productivity of the companies will increase due to robotic technologies and there will be no reverse course, which means we're going to have more people and fewer jobs for the foreseeable future. That's a huge problem and nobody is trying to address that at the governmental or institutional levels at all. The second side of the economic problem is not us as victims, but us as consumers. Robotic technologies are transforming the way marketing happens in companies. Because they can observe us, because they can soon observe the gaze direction of our eyeballs, the smirks we make with our lips when we see a price tag, what we say to our friend when we're looking at the shop window, all of the shopping and lurking that we do on the internet, on our mobile device, and with our feet in town. All of that allows them to data mine the precise ways in which they can maximize the flow of money from our pocket to their pocket, because they can market to it just right. And that optimal marketing has no end. They get better and better at that thanks to robotic technologies that allow them to do behavior analysis on us, people, very well. So at the same time, as we become greater and greater victims of productivity increases due to robotics technologies, we also become greater and greater consumers with less money in our pockets to those very same companies. So win for the companies, loss for society. The second one I mentioned was accountability. And... Um, Kevin talked uh, very well about some of the defense robotics work. The issue with accountability is that fundamentally robotics technologies broaden the hand of impact that any one individual has. One person can have impact in Afghanistan at a wedding where you can accidentally kill the entire wedding party. But it's worse than that. It's not one person anymore. It broadens my hand to reach out and touch Afghanistan and at the same time puts me in company with 50 other engineers, technicians, captains, corporals, and other people who all played a role in that attack on the wedding party in Afghanistan. As a result, we've diluted a sense of accountability to the point where it's no longer even clear from a legalistic or ethical or normative point of view who's responsible for a mistake when a robot makes a mistake. That sense of accountability has not been discerned or picked up, and that is a major problem that we have. Two weeks ago, there was an article in the Washington Post about yet another robotic development in line with what Owen was talking about, Kevin, sorry. Um, they have a robot that now does face detection as it flies around. It's a little drone. And the idea is it does face detection, identifies the face of the enemy, and then fires. And they're just simulating this, of course, right now with uh, not even rubber bullets. Maybe they're using Nerf balls right now. Uh, but they're being funded by the military, of course. Um, now, just to bring this home to you now and here, I, I have to give you a few quotes from Siri. Those of you who've been tracking the iPhone's progress uh, out of Foxconn, of course, uh, iPhone 4S just got released. And if you go to the Siri website, it talks about uh, what Siri can do. So check this out. Siri understands what you say, knows what you mean, and even talks back. 
Siri is so easy to use and does so much, you'll keep finding out more and more ways to use it. That's pretty good. That's kind of an agent robot, right, in my phone. Now, halfway down the screen, what it says on their website, and Siri is proactive, so it'll question you until it finds out what you're looking for. Oh, that's interesting. It's proactive. Now it seems to have a sense of embedded agency. Well, is it going to interrupt me while I'm trying to have a romantic conversation with my wife? Now, all the way down on the page, it gets even better. Using location services, it looks up where you live, where you work, and where you are. <laughs> then, it gives you information and the best options based on your current location. And, from the details in your contacts, it knows your friends, your family, your boss, and your coworkers. This is on Apple's website right now. <laughs> the marketing department doesn't even get that there's an issue with privacy that might come up here. As you pre create a proactive agent who knows everything about you, has access to all your apps, and knows who your boss is. So the problem we have is the design ethos we have at work in our society to help us pick apart a future in which robots have more agency and authority. <coughs> there is no design ethos vis-a-vis -vis privacy or job satisfaction, uh, job conservation, sorry. Last, I'll, I'll throw it out quickly because I'm out of time, is identity. The problem on the identity side is really interesting. The robots you're going to start seeing in our world, in some cases will exhibit agency, they'll make decisions on their own. In other cases, they'll be teleoperated. You won't know the difference. You won't know whether there's a human brain in control of it or not because it's not going to have a flag telling you that. What's worse, as you decide how to treat that robot, it will change how you treat other people. As we saw in the moral agency conversations and debates in this country around slavery uh, 200 years ago. And I'll give you one example about that, which is Bumbot. How many people know about Bumbot? Oh, good. This will be fun. So in Georgia, a fellow named Otero bought a pub, named it Otero, made an Irish-themed pub out of it, um, homeless people sat on the sidewalk in front of it. So what he did is he made a robot using Make Magazine recipes with a high-pressure water cannon body and a spotlight. He teleoperates it from inside the pub, goes up to the homeless people, and threatens to shoot high-pressure water at them, causing them to get off the sidewalk in front of his pub. This made the headlines hugely in the U.S. He was lauded for being an inventor and innovator. What you're going to see if you multiply that by a million, as robots become easier to build, is a million ideas, a million people coming up with whole new ways to create agency and teleoperation in machines all over the world that we get to interact with on their principles. And we have no sense of ethics around that or conversations at any level in society about how to regulate that. Thank you. Finally, we have Alan Winfield. Thanks, Alan. Thank you. Um, wow, well, follow that. Um, I, I, I was, well, I, I think I'll stick to my original script, which is that, um, that I'm, I'm not actually worried by AI, so I'm going to be completely, <laughs> going to disagree with these guys. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, the... the what, I, let me say that, that I, I love robotics. I like to do ro robotics. Um, and uh, rather, I'm a bit of an idealist, so I think that, that robots are things that can really uh, help us to understand ourselves. So, frankly, I'm not really interested, personally, in a robot that can vacuum my floor or, uh, you know, make coffee. Um, I'd rather actually do those things myself. Uh, but I am interested in a robot that can help, can help us to understand more about what intelligence is, uh, what life is, um, how evolution works. So for me, robotics is really no nothing to do with, with uh, utility, with, with real-world, everyday utility. It's about modelling. It's a new way of doing science. Uh, a new kind of synthetic approach to understanding life, intelligence, evolution, even culture, in fact. So I'm kind of positive about the, if you like, the robotics project. Let me call it that. The grand project of robotics. But I'm dismayed about... The, the level of misunderstanding in the world about what robots are and what robots can do. And so, you know, my, my, my answer to the question, um, should we fear AI, 
is no. But, but I qualify that by saying um, what we should fear is an astonishing level of misunderstanding about what AI is, about the state of the art in AI, about what's likely to happen in the near future. In fact, I think it's such an astonishing, such an extraordinary level of misunderstanding that it, it, it's almost at the level of, of a mass delusion, I would say. Um, I mean, let me just paint a little thought experiment for you uh, and, and to help you to understand what I'm getting at. Imagine that, that you're all roboticists, uh, but you've been stranded on a desert island for the last 30 years. So uh, you've been rescued and returned to civilization. Um, and of course, you're eager to find out what's happened in robotics. Of course, you, you know, you're, you're terribly opt optimistic. You think that, uh, that, that great things will have happened. And of course, you were. Uh, uh, you know, with this, on this, you discover this marvelous new internet thing, and and the, the magical search engines, and start to, to to find out about what what's happened in robotics, and and so you scour the headlines, and uh, to your amazement, you discover that robots right now, today, um, think, and have imaginations, have beliefs, uh, have feelings. Uh, robots apparently have a conscience. Um, robots, uh, according to a, 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 a headline just last week, uh, commit suicide. <laughs> I kid you not. So you think, wow, that's unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable. In fact, it's so unbelievable that you start to sort of dig underneath the headlines and, of course, you know, reality kicks in. The sober reality kicks in, and you realize that none of those things are true. That there isn't a single robot on the planet right now that can think, feel, love, have beliefs, be guilty, uh, have a conscience, certainly not uh, commit suicide in any meaningful sense. Of course, Great stuff has happened in robotics, but the problem is, um, and, and I'm, this is alluding back to, to the point that uh, Ela made, the problem is that it's, uh, it's not only profoundly uh, misreported, it's what I call robo-hype. So we're drowning in robo-hype. Um, as far as I can tell, there are only two headlines ever about robots. One is uh, robots are taking over the world. Uh, and the other is robots are crap. They're useless. <laughs> you know, so there's no place, basically, for people like us who make robots that are quite interesting. <laughs> um, but, but no, there's a serious point here. And um, I think that what we have is, uh, I think this is a danger. I think robot hype, hype about robots, robotics and AI, uh, is dangerous to the, the, the robotics project, as I put it at the beginning. It's dangerous, I think, for several reasons. There are three, what I call, crises of expectations. So there's the, the, uh, the expectation gap in the press and media, which I think I've just referred to. There's the, there's the expectation gap uh, among most ordinary people, and, and has, has been said already, most people think that real robots are like the ones in the, me in the movies. Why shouldn't they? Um, so it, it, it's science fiction uh, that informs most people's expectations of what real robots can do. So that's gap number two. But gap number three is that there's um, an expectation gap among funders, policymakers, stakeholders. So the guys who fund the kind of, of, of nightmare robot weapons that we've heard a little bit about already, many of them believe that the robots that they're funding are way more intelligent, way smarter than they really are. I, I, I reckon that, that it's hard to find a robot on the planet that you could seriously argue is much smarter than an ant. Now, would you be happy about something 
with the intelligence of, of an ant pulling the trigger of a gun. I certainly wouldn't. The, this third expectation gap um, is the most pernicious in my view because it's leading, uh, particularly leading roboticists uh, down a path of having to overpromise in grant and funding applications. Uh, we essentially, uh, we have to promise things that, that often we simply cannot deliver. We know we can't deliver it, deliver them, but we promise them anyway, because if we don't, we won't get the funding to do any robotics research. So uh, I think that uh, for the reasons I've said, all of these crises of expectations are bad for the robotics project. And none of those, of course, are a, a problem uh, fundamentally with AI. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, for the first question, it was um, something I've never really thought about before, but Ilan Norbash brought it up. And it's, and it, and it's particularly relevant, I think, because this department, we, in our robotics lab, we are, um, the research go, that goes on there is all about trying to teach robots by demonstration, so taking the programmer out of things, and also making it programmable by regular people. So my first question to the uh, to our guests is, viruses now have a huge impact on, uh, on the internet and on the computer systems worldwide. If robots, if robots become a, a common thing in our life and they're programmable by lay people or, or, or even people in their bedroom, will this, will this bring about perhaps, you know, very dangerous things in our life that we can't just, you know, turn off the computer with, you know, it's actually, it could be dangerous to our health. So, um, the first person, I'll ask Owen, what do you think about that? <coughs> All right, well, you have to remember that I'm not an AI person, but I do remember reading this last week that the Trojan virus had actually infected the computers which were controlling the United States drones operating in Afghanistan and other places. Um, and it looked as if the virus had come from a gambling website. Now, I think, this, <laughs> I think this tells you most of what you need to know about the potential dangers. And they say they're monitoring the virus and it hasn't done anything yet. So <laughs> I say good for that. Um, I'm not really equipped to answer this, but basically, if you're going to do uh, research in robotics, you will spend most of the time trying to fix your robot trying to make your robot do what you thought you'd programmed it to do in the first place. It's not just a problem with viruses, it's a problem with software reliability, with the robot operating in an open and, open and totally unpredictable environment. If you go to an engineer and say, I want my factory run by robots, the first thing you'll do is engineer the environment. Make it as simple as possible, remove the possibility that the robot in its actions could make a, could make a mistake. And I think the idea that we should only fear the viruses is that's just the, the icing uh, on the cake. That's the, the tip of the iceberg. We should fear the software because we actually don't know any way of, uh, of, uh, of doing that correctly. But just one thing you did mention um, about the, um, the idea of teaching by demonstration. Um, one of the... Uh, one of the things I remember from 20 years ago when there was a craze for making robot vacuum cleaner is a stream of people coming to me and saying, can you really make autonomous robots? You say, yes. And they say, well, how would I control it? You know, <laughs> and, and, and this, is, this is the bottom line. If you give the sort of discretion to the robot, then you've lost, you've given up you've given up control, whether it does what it's supposed to do or whether it does something completely different uh, because of a virus, I think is uh, just uh, you should forget about the virus and just think about the problems of getting it to do what it's supposed to do under all circumstances in the first place. Anything that physically moves in the environment, that does anything physical in the environment, can, in the wrong place, be a threat, period. Um. Ilan, would you like to comment on that since you've got... Yeah, yeah. sure. Uh, it, it's interesting. <laughs> What's fun about robots for us, what engages me and makes me live robotics, is that they push back on the world. They have physical impact on our physical world. 
And to me, that's much more exciting than anything on a two-dimensional screen that I look at. And indeed, every machine, every device that has digital <coughs> criteria inside of it can make mistakes because it has bugs. As we all know, you never squash all the bugs. But by the way, the populace generally doesn't know that, and that's a big problem. So that means anything that's pushing on the world can sometimes push wrong on the world. Now, that's not novel to robotics. Uh, autopilots on 747s and Airbuses do that. And we have entire fields of human factors and quality assurance that try and deal with that. And by the way, we still have airplanes crashing once in a while. And by the way, sometimes it has to do with the autopilot. So nothing is perfect. And robots aren't in a special space that way. Uh, the, the virus question, I agree, is a, is a minor issue. The major issue is we don't understand, as we enable and let loose into the wild more and more people to be inventive with robots, how we can control for the impact the robots will have. I'll give you one example and stop. In Nevada, they passed a law this last month. They passed a law after sufficient pressure was induced upon Nevada by Google Corporation. The law is that autonomous, self-driving cars will be able to drive in Nevada. Now, what's hilarious about this is that the Congress of Nevada, the the legislators that passed this law, they're not computer scientists, they're not roboticists. They don't get the concept of what it means for two-ton vehicles to be controlled by a computer, okay? Even though they've had their Microsoft Windows Vista program crash, they haven't connected that to the car <laughs> somehow. So somehow they haven't made the connection, right? And so here you have legislators making decisions that will put very large, deadly devices on the road without an <coughs> obvious tendency to think about quality assurance and how you make those things actually reliable. Uh, nobody's thought about what happens when a kid comes along and spray paints the camera on the autonomous car with some black paint. Ah, that will happen. And then what happens as a result of that is an unknown space of legislation and reaction instead of proaction. Uh, mm. That's it. Mm. Um, and would any, would Alan or Kevin like to comment on this? Well, a part of me is not so worried for the kind of the reason that, that, uh, that Owen alluded to, which is to make that, that making robots is hard. So mostly when you make robots, they don't work. <laughs> um, and anybody who, uh, you know, anybody who tries to, to make robots will soon discover that. Um, uh, but yes, I mean, the, you know, I, I try, I, I keep... I, I have this thing about robotics is 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 not it, there's nothing particularly remarkable and special about robotics compared with other new technologies. I mean, it, it's certainly a disruptive technology, um, but uh, you know, um, nearly a hundred years ago, perhaps a little less, uh, uh, seventy or eighty years ago. Um, people, for the first time, could make radios themselves. You know, you could, you could if you went and, and bought issues of practical wireless, um, you could actually make your own radios. So, uh, you know, okay, you might think, well, a radio is a very kind of benign sort of technology, but, but not so at the time. I mean, it was, you know, uh, you know I remember as a boy... Um, uh, you know, uh, um, connecting uh, an old uh, army uh, ex World War II radio's uh, antenna to the, I thought it would be fun to use the the, the whole of the the the, uh, the central heating system in in <laughs> my parents' house as the as the antenna for this. You see, and um, uh, and and I mean, you you probably you, you guys are too young, but there used to be things called pirate radio stations that that you know. Uh, so, you know, it's certainly true that, that, that robotics, there's a huge scope and space for, uh, for hobby kind of hacker type people to, you know, to play with robots. But I don't think that's profoundly different to uh, anything much that's happened, you know, with other technologies uh, in, in, you know, in, in recent centuries, if, if not longer. Um, Can I say, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, I don't know whether this is uh, tackling the question. Um, if you look at what humans are, I believe intelligence is the key element. It puts us in a pretty powerful position on Earth in comparison with other creatures. Um, and if we're developing machines that are intelligent themselves, 
then it has to be competitive in some way. I, I think Alan's likening machines to the intelligent something like ants. Well, on the one, you know, ants are pretty cool. Don't they, they <laughs> do some good stuff? Um, and, uh, True. You know, that, so it's, that's not bad. But I think to, to look at that and say, hey, that means artificial intelligence is stupid, well, that's wrong because there are big differences between the way the human brain, human intelligence, and machine intelligence. The first AI, the Minsky type things, was trying to get machines to copy human intelligence. It was limited to a human centric view. And out of that, we get strong AI, weak AI. This is AI in, in two seconds and so on. And then you have breakaway groups in Carnegie Mellon at start, excellent university started to look at more broader spread of what artificial intelligence machines could be in their own right intelligence, not just limiting it to the puny human form of intelligence, but all sorts of much broader intelligence, taking in the advantages of AI, such as the mathematical processing abilities, which humans cannot compete with such as the memory capabilities, which human intelligence cannot compete with, <coughs> such as the communication abilities. AI, in, for the most part, is networked. This is the best it gets for human brains. Big, big advantage of AI in terms of communication particularly. So it goes on. The amount of sensory input the human brain takes in is limited to a puny f set of frequencies vision is okay, machines can take in all sorts of other sort of information and perceive the world in a multi-dimensional way. Humans think in 3D, that's, that's the limit to it. I would love to have my brain connected to a machine brain and start thinking in 10 or 11 dimensions, but I can't because I'm human and I'm limited. How do you perceive what a machine is thinking about an ant? with 10 dimensional thought. An ant with mathematical processing far, far outperforming the human brain. An ant with networked intelligence that it can download, Google, it can upload Wikipedia, zing, 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 zing. A machine intelligence has enormous range of advantages, most of which, as a human, is very, very difficult to us, for us to perceive. Any thought that we have of a machine being programmed it will do what we want to do. If any of you think that now, forget it, for Christ's sake. Just like humans, as soon as we're born, we have a program. Then we start learning and adapting, and it depends on what we learn, what we experience. This is why we have wonderful universities, such as Imperial College, to learn the right sort of proper things and so on. Machines that learn, which is part of AI, learning experience, will then do what they do, based on what we've programmed or who's programmed them, but based on what they learn, based on what they experience. Thank you. No. Um, following on from that, we seem to have a bit of disagreement on um, where AI and robotics is. Um, two things that I, I think, personally, this is the last question before I'll take it to the audience, by the way. Um, so the pro, uh, something which says to me that robotics might be an exponential technology, a little bit like the internet, some people say is, or the Human Genome Project, um, is that, well, one, one thing is that DARPA are now saying that robotics is, is their main focus, is, is the big thing for them. And they have a pretty good track record in that they, they really supported the internet back, back when it was very, very basic. And so, Perhaps that, that's a, something, something we can use to say, you know, robotics will be big in the future. Robotics is going to grow. Like, maybe now it's not very much, but maybe more in the future. The thing which I would like to say, uh, which, which I think me, maybe means that it's not as fantastic as um, Professor Curran Warwick says, is that a lot of the technologies which go into robotics at the moment are bio-inspired. So they're inspired by, for example, the brain. And whenever you make a, well, whenever I've made a neural network thing before, it's been, it's a big matrix of, of numbers which connect neurons. And, okay, you can train it, and it will give you, it might give you some good output when you give it input, but you can't look into it, it's not transparent. And, and so, if we use these kind of things, can we really connect that to the internet? Can we really connect that to Wikipedia Be in a better way than we can connect a human to Wikipedia? Um, so yeah, those are my two ideas about um, things. Is robotics an exponential technology? And uh, yeah, so Alan, you were shaking your head a lot. <laughs> um, 
there's a, uh, there's a very good uh, Cambridge economist called Harjun, uh, ha, Harjun Chang. Is that the right? I, I think. Chang, anyway. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, who has written a, a great book um, uh, on the myths of capitalism. And, um, and it's worth reading. And uh, he describes, he, he reckons that the, uh, by far the most important invention of the 20th century, and I'm sure he's right about this, is the washing machine, the humble washing machine. Um, and the reason I mention that is because it's quite hard to, uh, to predict beforehand what you think is going to be the most important invention. So, uh, you know... Um, you know, we, we tend to assume that, that because a technology is super cool, then it's going to be really, really important in the future. Um, I, I think that, that ro robotics um, is taking off, uh, but I'm, as I mentioned before, dismayed by some of the directions that it's taking off in. And I have to say that I'm uh, very much of one mind with particularly with, with uh, Owen and, uh, and, and I think Ila um, touched on the same thing, which is that um, I think that we're, we're, we're worrying about the wrong kinds of problems. Um, and particularly because much of what happens in terms of funding of new science and technology <coughs> is driven by, by either... Uh, large-scale military demands or driven by capitalism, you know, by, by corporate, um, uh, you know, demands. And what worries me is that those are the wrong drivers for robotics. I mean, I, I personally, again, I'm, I'm going to be optimistic, I think that robotics has tremendous potential for benefit to humanity, but not if if the people who are deciding <coughs> what and how to, to spend the big money on robotics are interested either in only in, in a military perspective or in making a book. Okay, I, I agree with what Alan is saying quite strongly. Uh, I want to put it uh, with a different, different polish on it as well. The issue isn't when will these robots... Uh, I, I, so, so Kevin was describing this idea of AI and that, you know, that ants can be super cool. And I, I grant you that an ant with AI can be super cool, but that's not our problem. Our problem isn't superhuman intelligence. Our problem is mediocre robots used yeah. by people yeah. for poor purposes. And mediocre robots are here now. They're going to disseminate more. We're going to have lots more mediocre robots. These are not humans, okay? Uh, you can't compare them to humans. They're all much better than us at adding numbers. That's right. And they're much stupor, stupider than us at recognizing a baby carriage and deciding to die for the tree rather than hit the baby carriage. So there's ways in which these things are downright demented, and people are going to use them anyway. The Predator drone is not very smart, but it changes the rules of war, it changes the rules of engagement, it changes the international laws governing assassination. And it's not a very smart robot. It's not that it's AI smart. It's that you take a few bits and pieces from robotics, you make a mediocre robot, and it changes culture. And that's going to happen more and more. That's what concerns me. So I agree. Defense and, and economy-motivated robotics has a, a dangerous side to it in terms of where it steers our culture way before we achieve sort of a superhuman or even uh, equal to human intelligence in their brains. We don't even need that <coughs> to see real threats to our culture. And, um, I agree. I mean, I think picking up on that last point, you, if you look back through um, human history, there are many, many examples. I mean, take what happened in Central America, or even uh, America, with uh, you, you could say Aztecs had a wonderful culture, they had education system, they had uh, transport systems, I think they even had wheels that they used for toys, but not for. And along came some Europeans. Uh, with a bit of disease, but they had weapon systems and wiped the floor with them, really. And the weapons, and, but the, the, and this is the critical point here, what should we fear AI? Um, it doesn't have to be intelligent at all in the same form as human intelligence. You know, it is different. It, it has advantages, but it has disadvantages as we've heard. 
but it's those those differences are the critical things. You know, a, a, a stupid guy that runs in here with a machine gun, he's dangerous. We have to fear such a person. We can't say, oh, you're stupid, your IQ is <laughs> your, your IQ is 25, you can't shoot me. <laughs> That's daft. Then it's the same with a, a cruise missile. If we had a cruise missile coming towards us now, a flying cube, and say, ah, oh, you don't understand your British humour or something. <laughs> <laughs> the cruise missile is not going to say, oh, yeah, that's a good point, damn, and go back again. <laughs> so it, it is the power that goes with the AI, and it, it is my fear, and should we fear AI? Yes, because of the, the military machines don't necessarily have to have human or superhuman intelligence. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> There's, uh, I agree with everybody. It's, uh, <laughs> robotics is potentially disruptive. It's uh, potentially materially disruptive, socially disruptive, legally disruptive, culturally <coughs> disruptive. And we'll all agree on that. But what can you do about it? Um, and just uh, a couple of quick anecdotes from my own research about 15 years ago. I decided, I'm fed up with all this talk of robots being completely autonomous when you kept having to change their batteries all the time. <laughs> so I decided to build, try and build a robot that would keep itself going. And the idea was that it would catch slugs, um, ferment them to methane, and use the methane as a power source. So it would be a totally self-sufficient uh, system. Managed to get the money for it by making extravagant claims, of course, as we have to do. Um, but, but when, <laughs> yeah, thank, thanks to thanks to the anonymous referees. Yeah, yeah. Um, and um, but when the news got out, um, it was uh, I was attacked by Greenpeace, <laughs> uh, um, and basically there was an, and sometime later it won the. Uh, Invention of the year in Time magazine in about 2001, 2002, years after we'd made it, and it never worked, but it still won. And, they, and, and there was a, a letter in the following issue saying this robot was a step across a line which we should never cross. In other words, this sort of research should be banned. And again, when I was working on a project to build a conscious robot, um, there is a very well known philosopher, Thomas Metzinger who is very concerned about building robots that might, or AI systems that might have a certain kind of artificial self. And he called seriously for this kind of research to be banned. Right? So one way of stopping these things is to try and ban them. Um, now, I don't think for a moment that will stop them on the entire planet and so on. But the thing is that once they're here, it's almost impossible to stop them. And this, I think, is the real problem. They're going to be deployed. And basically, if we put our faith in the market, uh, well, we can see the consequences of that by reading the newspapers uh, every day. I think we do need to think in terms of some kind of regulation. But as Alan uh, and Illa has pointed out, there's no framework within which to do this. So, but it's quite an urgent problem. Thank you very much. OK, so now I'll open the, um, <coughs> open the questions up to the audience, who would like. Yes, Oliver. Uh, so you, you've, uh, you've, you've read quite a lot on the way robotics are now and that it's going to be quite disruptive, but where do you see robotics going in, well, maybe 100 years is too near. What about 1,000 years? <laughs> are you really going to take 1,000-year predictions? I mean, is that of any value? <laughs> Seriously. It, it's hard enough to get scientists to agree five-year predictions. When I go to conferences and walk away from the conference and we joke about RoboCup, RoboCup is a soccer, robot soccer thing, um, half the people I'm with will say, oh, yeah, 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 in 30 years, robots will be beating, beating humans at football. You call it football here, right? <laughs> That's what they say, and they honestly believe it, half the people. And the other half is saying, you're mad. That'll take hundreds of years. And you get out more than five or six years out, no professors can agree or even really visualize where technology is. My one answer to you is, robotics is not governed by Moore's law, and you have to remember that. In robotics, we have energy, we have motors, and controllers, and chassis systems. The problem is the advances in battery energy density and power density technology, as well as in motors and series electric actuation, have been in fits and starts. You'll go through 10 years with nothing, and then a little incremental improvement, and then 10 more years of nothing. So it's very hard to draw a line, a curve, like you can with Moore's Law, and say, oh, good, we can imagine what's going to happen in 20 years. 
Okay. Uh, um, so there's been a lot of talk about ants and their comparative intelligence <laughs> to uh, the most intelligent of human ro of, of, sorry, of, of, of existing robots. Um, so uh, I mean, I I, um, I was uh, notwithstanding the fact that we can sort of simulate to an extent the, the neuron networks of ants. Um, the, I was I mean I was using a robot a few days ago, which was a, a tennis ball um, mach throwing machine, which which would at a particular predefined velocity would throw me tennis balls. I mean that's just a very loose term. But I I mean. Um, that, that is much more reliable than a human being at throwing me tennis balls. And I would much prefer to, be, to rely on a, on a tennis ball throwing robot than the best tennis player to feed me these tennis balls at a consistent velocity and, uh, and at a reliable um, sort of um, accuracy. Um, in a similar respect, um, uh, humans all the time make mistakes, uh, when, especially when in, in situations like flying aircraft uh, and, and killing people. Um, uh, I, for one, um, think that uh, I, I would m be much more trusting of, uh, of a robot, um, com uh, whether it may be more or less intelligent than that, to, uh, to, to kill someone and make that kind of decision than, uh, than a human being. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, I is it much use having uh, a a applying human concepts such as intelligence uh, to specific um, weak AI? Such as that used to fly planes and that used to um, control drones, algorithms used for that sort of thing. Um. Yeah, I'd like to put some input into this because uh, lots of people, especially in AI, think that, hey, we're the smartest things on the planet without thinking how we got this way or why we are smart. And it's one of the big puzzles in biology. We're far too smart. Our brains are far too big to cope with the material world. And one of the theories that is gaining more and more weight as we go by is humans are so smart because you've got to be smart to deal with other humans. They're the competition. We don't have to worry about lions, tigers, or finding, finding fruit. It's the other guys there. Um, when they've looked at hunter-gatherer societies, the estimate is that something like a third of the men, at least, died through violence. Um, so we have to think in terms, our intelligence is what evolved, and we don't know enough about the evolutionary pressures, but we've got the sort of intelligence that fits living in groups, competing with other groups. For example, one of the uh, human left-handedness is, is an odd thing. Left-handers, I, I prefer to hire left-handers. They have talents I don't have as a completely right-handed person. They're different. Why have they persisted? And one of the ideas about left-handers persisting is to introduce some variety into the mix. So it's not that every human being has to be super smart. It's that when you've got a group, the group has to act intelligently, which means you've got to get as many different ideas in. So to expect reliability from human beings, theoretically, I think is a bit of a pipe dream. So I agree. Um, on the other hand, I'd rather watch the human tennis player than watch your, <laughs> your tennis ball throwing machine. <laughs> It, it, may I add to that? I, I mean, I think the question of, of, of intelligence is, is very interesting, um, but, I, but I, I'd share this. Uh, I think it's very important to, to re remember, to understand that intelligence isn't a single thing that different animals and robots have more or less of. That, that's simply not true. Um, so, uh, and it's very difficult. In fact, if you, if you try and find a definition of intelligence, you'll find it talks about IQ or something doesn't tell you anything about animals. Um, and, uh, and it's very difficult even to rate on a scale. I mean, we, we all have a sense that, you know, a cat is smarter than a crocodile, and a crocodile smarter than a cockroach, somehow. But we have no real biological or, or you know, uh, ethological basis for, for, for believing that. Um, so, actually, figuring out you know, I go back. I go back to my ant about as smart as an ant thing. Uh, figuring out, really figuring out where robots are on some kind of notional scale of intelligence is more or less impossible. I want to uh, address your robot war desire um, in a way other than putting you in a special padded room, <laughs> <laughs> and that is to point out that the example of the tennis ball throwing machine. You have to discriminate between systems that are there to do the same thing over and over again with high precision and reliability, like a welding robot on an assembly line or a tennis ball throwing machine, which are fundamentally completely antisocial systems. Um, and indeed, mechanisms can play a great role there. You have to distinguish that from situations where 
a system needs to have perception. It has to make decisions by thinking in some way or using some kind of cognitive system, uh, deciding what to do in some way that demonstrate agency, and then and then actually actuating some, some resultant effect. And war is the ultimate strong, not weak, <laughs> AI problem. Just like driving, uh, and just like having a question and answer session with you. So those are the situations in which, in fact, suddenly you're dealing with challenges that have to do with what makes us truly human, with our ability to take complex information, make sense of it, and then use the sense making we've done to make a decision about how to act. It's totally different, a uh, completely different sphere from the idea of repetitive, uh, fine-grained actions like tennis ball throwing. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, the, the warmongering thing is, is not so good for humans. If you're looking at the, the wars that human, even now, but ones they have been involved with, well, there's been a lot of ethnic cleansing of what, just because you're of a particular religious persuasion or you're a particular ethnic persuasion, therefore your life's invalid. Uh, it's not worth anything in a particular environment. That's what humans are like. And one would hope that AI might be a little bit easier on groups of humans and at least uh, let them live quietly on some remote island. <laughs> <laughs> That's your thousand year question. <laughs> okay, any other questions? Um, I'll take one from the back. Yep. Yeah, um, I just wanted to ask a question. A bit, a little bit off topic, but not really that much. I'm not too concerned with robotics. Uh, there was an article I read uh, some time back, and I wanted to get the panel's opinion on this. It was in Time magazine. It was um, on, a, on, a, on a guy called Raymond Kurzweil. Mm. And Never his, no <laughs> you know, uh, his, his belief in uh, the singularity, and he's, he's written a book about that. And, um, well, Bill Gates announced that he was the smartest guy he knew at predicting the future. And NASA and Google and I think Microsoft have come together to, to build, they're building, a, they've already, I think they've already built the university, it's three years old, the University of the Singularity in America to try and find out what will happen because of this, this exponential rise. Because he, he states a lot of things um, that when you look throughout history, when you look at the agricultural revolution to the industrial, to landing a man on the moon, to the genome project, to, to elevators that go to space, all of these things that have been planned, when he says that the way things are going is they're going, we know that they're going exponentially, but he has said that uh, by the year 2020, it'll start kicking off, and by the year 2045, the exponential rise will be so much that when you hit that time, that time called the singularity, you won't be able to predict what happens past that, because like throughout history, like in the 1980s, he says that a GB of uh, storage space cost $200,000. Today, a terabyte costs about $150. When he talks about all of these examples that clearly indicate that uh, that technology has reached a point where it is shooting up too far up. So I just wanted to know what the panel's opinion on the singularity would be. Do you, do you believe that it's something worth which is credible, or do you believe that it's, it's, it's one of those other prophecies that won't come true? It's incredible, in my view. <coughs> I, it, may I? Um, yeah. I mean, it, it, in my view, the, the Kurzweil, Moravec, Werner Vinge singularity uh, hy hypothesis is 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 an application. It, it, it's it's a demonstration of the fallacy of Moore's law. Fundamentally, um, I mean, what what they're essentially arguing is that uh, because of the exponential rise of processing power, then we will achieve. Uh, what they describe as human level artificial intelligence within what 20 30 years um, and of course as soon as humans uh, soon sorry as soon as this ai is smarter than than humans then then that is the the point at which they which they argue is the singularity um, i i think they're profoundly wrong um, i think you know uh, uh, in the in the literal sense that uh, that that Human level artificial intelligence, uh, in my view, certainly will not uh, occur, happen uh, within that time frame. Uh, uh, in my view, uh, it's far too far in the future to uh, to make a uh, even make a prediction. Um, but I think I, I think there's also a fallacy with the, the, the you know the very idea that suddenly there is this point at which this you know a day happens when when everything changes profoundly. Um, 
you know, you, you, I, I was sitting having a beer with, with Ila um, in the, the pub uh, near, uh, near the lab uh, in Bristol a, a, a few weeks ago, and, uh, and we were reflecting on the fact that, that pretty much everything that, that we could see and everything we were doing, um, uh, if, if we'd been sat there 200 years ago, uh, we'd, we'd have been basically drinking the same kind of beer from the same kind of glasses, uh, looking at the same... Uh, uh, church and, and school and, and, and so on. Um, so ac actually, the lesson of history is that, is that most things change rather slowly. Most things. Yeah, I'd just like to... I referred to Jordan Pollack earlier. Um, he, uh, he said something else which uh, didn't get picked up, and I think we should go around shouting it, and it was this. Software does not obey Moore's law. <laughs> so you can have as much hardware as you want, mm. unless you know how to program it or educate it, otherwise educated, it isn't going to do anything spectacularly new. So I think what we can expect, as well as the linear, if we're lucky, progress with batteries, motors, gearboxes, uh, and sensors and so on, we're going to see, I think, sublinear pro progress in software. Mm. Um, and I think, even though the singularity is a very nice marketing idea. I still think there's going to be lots of post-singularity universities, so I shouldn't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I agree. I just want to make two quick points. One is we get left turns te in technology development. Trying to draw a line and say that's where we're headed turns out more or less always to be wrong because pr pr primarily what companies end up spending money on is what sells, and what sells is enhanced communication technologies. And so it's not that we're going to be trying to make that super smart robot anyway. We're probably going to end up making much better telepresence systems so that you can stay in touch with your family wherever they are. We're going to take these turns that I can't possibly predict. And that's where the money is going to push this forward, not the direction that we might be thinking right now. The second bit, just a little story for you. So, so Bill Gates said Singularity is awesome. Chris Vile is one of the most intelligent people I know. Um, and the Google guys invested in it, yes indeed. And the campus is at NASA Ames, which is true. Uh, but just a little story for you. A long time ago, a guy named Dean Kamen, about 15 years ago, uh, went to Silicon Valley with a little duffel bag, and he assembled this thing that he called Ginger, which was a Segway prototype. And he showed it to Steve Jobs, and he showed it to Steve Wozniak, and he showed it to Bill Gates. And the three of them were quoted in the paper, and what did they say? They said, this is the most revolutionary invention ever. It's going to change the way all cities are built. <laughs> you remember that? That was the Segway. I believe it didn't cause that revolution. And the point I'm trying to make is these people are intelligent and they have a lot of money. That's true. They do have a lot of money. But as Alan pointed out, they're different kinds of intelligence. The fact that they're smart and they have lots of money doesn't mean they have any clue how to predict the future technologically. Uh, it looks like I'm a bit different from our panel members. Um, I think, I, I don't know about the human level. I, I think that's uh, <coughs> seeing that as the issue here. But AI developing, being given the capabilities that become dangerous to humans, that being the singularity, where effectively we would go so far as to lose control of it, yes, I see that as a realistic possibility. And then you go, well, what do we do about it? Do we stop development, pushing things forward? In the military, we say, right, you can't do it anymore. Well, I, I, don't, I don't see that as a practical reality. Maybe it would be good to try and do it, but I can't see it practically happening. So one alternative, and, and it, it, it sort of what's the view, when we come out of the singularity, what's the situation? I mean, there you have different feelings. Is it... Um, Terminator-style intelligent robots running the road, or, or what? I mean, certainly not looking at humans. So the, the possibility of merging with it, I see as a realistic way through. So humans can upgrade and stay ahead of it, I hope. So I see it as a realistic threat, yes. Not for the human level intelligence. I think that's a red herring. Um, and whether, I don't, I'm not sure that Ray has actually said that but a level of intelligence uh, with the power and the capabilities that we as humans give AI, particularly in the military, financial sector, that we ultimately lose control over it. Whether that's at one point again, I, I agree with the guys, it may not have been, you know, oh, no, oh, don't, you know, it's 10 past three, oh, damn, missed it. You know, I, I, you know it, it may, we're not gonna know what the point is, it's whether we're into that. Sort of I think there are dangers there. We've, we've got to watch out what's going if we can. 
upgrade, then that's great, or steer it another way, that's great. Thank you. Uh, uh, one quick comment on that is that uh, I heard that the, so the kind of example of exponential technologies is Moore's law, but, and I don't know how true this is, but I heard that someone said that Moore's law was the cause of this exponential growth, <laughs> and that Intel, yes. in their meetings, would say, okay, what's the plan? And they would say, well, 18 months ahead, we must have twice as many transistors. <laughs> and so maybe it's, yeah. Um, any other questions? I'll ask this guy at the front, he had his hand up last time. Um, so how long do you believe it will take us to create something more intelligent than us? <laughs> we're, we're back to only Alan saying, you know, what is intelligent, is it a, uh, you know, the, I mean, if you, if you said, right, here's a, here's a dump of money, we want to create something with the highest IQ in the world, then I don't mean, think the four of us would be happy to take the money and, you know, three, <laughs> three or four years, we'd come up with something that we, we would define as having the highest IQ. So, I mean, it, it really does depend more intelligent than us what do you mean? In some ways, you could say there are machines that are far more intelligent than us. Now, you know, as, as we've heard, if intelligence is defined as, as how you throw tennis balls, then great. Just down the road from here, uh, 130 odd years ago, Sir Francis Galton uh, ran a series of experiments looking at human intelligence. And he did things, he was some uncle or something, or cousin of Darwin, I can never remember which, somebody might know. And he did things like, you know, pricking fingers. How closely can you prick your finger? He did things of putting boxes that were, one was 100 kilograms, uh, sorry, 100 grams, 101 grams, 102 grams, so on. And you had to put them in order. These were little experiments. A whole series of experiments, and people were doing it at, at the Science Museum as a sort of a, a party piece, but to see who was the most intelligent. The problem was there was no statistical link as to why if you could do these boxes you were more intelligent. Along came things like IQ where there were then links. People that tended to do well on IQ tests tended to do well on exams in Greek and Latin on obscure subjects like that. And hence we've got some indications of human intelligence based on performance in exams and written things as though this is some indication. So it does depend very, very much from the word go how are we defining intelligence, in hu even in humans? If you we all had, you know, different, uh, and uh, you know, my my mother uh, had dementia. Uh, she, you know, if, I, if I'm trying to get a machine that has had better intelligence than her, particularly in communication. Sorry to say, my my mum, God rest her soul, and everything, but she could not communicate at all. So just getting some machine that says hi probably is have more intelligence in a communication sense than my mother had in the, the latter stages of her life. So. The problem with machine intelligence is we always find loopholes. I'll give you an example. You, you remember, how many of you remember Watson, the IBM machine mm. that beat the humans in Jeopardy? So how did it actually work? What did it actually do? Why did it beat the people? Well, that's an interesting story, right? You talk to the engineers. In Jeopardy, when you get to the top of the chain, they all know the answers almost all the time. So who wins? Well, when they ask the question, a light turns on, and then you have to hit your buzzer. You can't hit it before the light turns on. If you do, then you don't qualify to answer that question. So you have to wait for the light to turn on, and you have to hit the buzzer. And they all know the answers. So it's actually really funny, right? At that level of success in Jeopardy, it's a, it's a reaction test. <laughs> how fast can you press a button after a light turns on? Which is one of the things that Galton was testing, how quickly you could win. And the, the, the fun bit is, as you can imagine, a robot's pretty good at that. <laughs> <laughs> they direct wired the computer to the light. It didn't even have to look at the camera. And they decided, let's see, let's put in a 20 millisecond delay. Yeah, okay, 20 milliseconds, sure. So after the light turns on, 20 milliseconds later, the robot presses the button. Oh, well. Brilliant. And that was Brilliant. Watson beating humans at jeopardy. My god, it's intelligent. Yes, I, I admit that means it knew the answers. Which is pretty good, right? That's pretty good. That's that's good use of search techniques and statistical data mining. <coughs> but there's always these funny loopholes, and you get yourself always tripped up with that. Uh, it's impossible, I think, to give you a prediction for its gen general intelligence of a human because that, as we pointed out, is so multidimensional. 
Because it shows how smart the guys at IBM were. Yeah. <laughs> so it shows how stupid we are, because we could have got some money to do it, right? <laughs> <laughs> Giving it away now. Could, could, could I just add to the, uh, the, the, the uh, comments on this question? Um, I, there's a, there's a, again, it, I think it comes from the movies. So, so we, we tend to imagine that, that, that really, really smart robots, smart, you know, smart machine intelligence, however we define it, uh, will somehow think like us. Wrong. Um, you know, and, and it's whatever movie you choose, take d data from Star Trek or, or um, Bicentennial Man, or even, you know, Terminator, still kind of, you know, in a rugged sort of way, has, <laughs> has feelings, you know, and kind of has a bit of a conscience in the end. Um, uh, whatever, however, this, this future highly intelligent machine intelligence thinks it will not be like humans. It, it, it will be a profoundly alien intelligence. Can I just add to that though, Alan, because we have these crazy people who are into SETI. This is sending signals into outer space. And uh, exactly as you're saying, mm -hmm. if there is any inter intelli intellectual, intelligent life form out there, Either it will be so stupid it won't recognise the signals we're sending, in which case what a waste of time, or it will be super intelligent and uh, if there's any experience from human history, it will come down here, wipe the floor with us, take the planet and so on. <laughs> so <laughs> that's, that's, there's only two choices as far as I can see. In one case it's a waste of time, the other one it's the most stupid thing possibly <laughs> doing, sending out signals to say, hey, look at us idiots here, <laughs> come and destroy our planet. And I, I think, uh, so if you do ever spot any SETI people, get, that's, let's build the robot to just go around, are you anything to do with SETI? Yes, boom, boom, that's it. <laughs> Not Sarah Connor, it's SETI. That's uh, what are you suggesting Douglas Adams is wrong? Oh. <laughs> well, I was going to say, we all need to make sure we have our towel handy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, sorry, how would you define intelligence? What's the problem with the definition of intelligence? I think you can't define it. That's like trying to define robots. You'll get 10 different definitions from five people. <laughs> yeah, just go to a psychology department, ask them what they mean by <laughs> intelligence, and then you can leave. They will carry on, they will carry on arguing for years. Just, just to, to do the thing, there is this wonderful book, Artificial Intelligence. <laughs> we can, we can, sorry, just, I'm Google. And, uh, no, it's... Uh, it's extremely difficult. I mean, people have tried to make the point that uh, we are not actually smart enough to understand our own intelligence, yeah. right? And looking at the record, this is, you know, one of the horses to put a bet on, really. But it's a tremendously complex uh, area, and even the basis of intelligence test, be, because it was correlated with high achievement, well, now they've realized, well, actually, this other thing is correlated with high achievement, like persistence, particularly, yeah. stickability. And this turns out actually to be a far better predictor um, than intelligence tests. So the whole IQ thing is on a rather shaky foundation. Unless, unless you look at it as a very, very basic thing in terms of the um, information processing elements that work together to form some sort of life or successful entity. You know, so it's a very, very basic thing, something like that. But then you have arguments as to whether life or entity and what it means. Here's what you can do. You can think in terms of the imitation game, right? You can go back to Alan Turing, and for a particular context, right, you can think about imitation and think about whether or not you can discern uh, whether a robot's under teleoperative control by a human or whether it's on its own, so to speak, without being teleoperated by a human. And you can think about a particular context, whether you're playing chess with it or whether you're having a conversation with it or you're going ice skating with it. And in a particular context like that, you can think about the imitation game and then you can imagine, I'm going to get my PhD by making a robot that is, is as capable as a human with teleoperating that robot. That's one way to think about it. But again, to, to do that, to go there and to stay sane, you have to think about a particular context in which you're testing and interacting with it. Wouldn't this be a behavioral definition of intelligence? Um, We've got to give it, uh, <laughs> the time's up anyway, but yeah, we should have opened it up to other people. Um, I think, I think that's enough. Um, oh. <laughs> oh. I'm sorry, uh, it's half past. Um, so, firstly, a big round of applause to our...
Okay, and now we have a little bit of food and some drinks upstairs in 611. Um, last time I held an event, the guests didn't get any food because some people came in the you know, <laughs> So, this time, um, Hamza will guide you upstairs to 611. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, just before you leave... Just send um, them to the wrong room. Sorry? Send them to the wrong room. <laughs> That's a good idea. Uh, just before you leave, one second, Hamza. Do you have? Yeah, sure. Uh, just to say thank you to our guests, we just got some some cards to give to them. And yeah, much. so a round of applause again. It's been really great.